For the past three decades, astronomers have been trying to locate all of the normal matter that is supposed to exist in the universe. As one scientist put it, and I love this quote, it's been a true embarrassment that we haven't been able to find it. Oh, there's no need to be embarrassed any longer. Scientists reported in the journal Nature this week that the matter has been located. One of the authors of the paper is Associate Professor Jean-Pierre Marcart from the University of Curtin Node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. Jean-Pierre, thanks so much for being with us. Good to be here, Nola. Let's start at the beginning. How did you know the matter was missing? Well, we looked at the early universe, the imprint of the, uh, of the Big Bang, the relic radiation from the Big Bang. And from that, we're able to deduce how much matter there was in the universe uh, when it was in its infancy. And that was about four or five percent of the total uh, content of the universe. Uh, so that's how much we knew was there. But when we looked with optical telescopes at the present day universe, we looked up how many galaxies there are, how massive they are. Uh, our sums came in embarrassingly short. We we're a factor of two out. We had the missing matter gone. And we should clarify, this is ordinary baryonic matter like totally separate from dark matter, meaning that in theory we should be able to see it. Oh, absolutely. This is, this is the stuff that you and I are made of. The, the table, the chairs, the atmosphere, planets, stars, galaxies, all the stuff that we see, all the stuff that you, you know and love about you. It's all baryonic matter. And this gas we would be able to detect far more easily if it were in a far more dense state. The problem is that it's distributed very sparsely throughout the universe and that makes it very difficult. But it's completely different from dark matter whose uh, only, a, uh, only influence is a gravitational one. If we were to shove all of this dark matter together, we wouldn't be able to see it still. So how did you go about finding it? Oh, well, that's a $64,000 question. So we used a very special piece of kit in Western Australia called the Australian SKA Pathfinder. And it has this ability to see a very large patch of the sky all at once. Uh, it can see about the equivalent of uh, 60 full moons in the field of view. And that's essential if you're going to, to uh, look for fast radio bursts, which are the things that we use to detect this missing matter. If you don't know where these things go are going to occur or when, then you need to see as much of the sky as possible. And that's what ASCAP does for us. It sees as much of the sky as possible. So it casts a net far and wide across the swathes of the universe. And then when it does find them, the next party piece is that it's able to localize them, to, to pinpoint their positions so precisely that we are able to go uh, to an optical telescope and say, ah, ah, it came from precisely that galaxy and that point in that galaxy. And that's, that's the real crux of it. It's like real estate, location, location, location. Right, so you've solved one mystery with locating the missing matter, but now there's another mystery in terms of these FRBs and that we, we don't know what causes them. Are there any theories? There are plenty of theories. And, and until recently, actually, there were more theories for what causes FRBs than there were FRBs known, which is not an entirely pleasant state of affairs. But uh, the, the situation has reversed and in, indeed telescopes like ASCAP are able to actually eke out the information on these FRBs on timescales down to nanoseconds. And so you're able to, uh, to actually look at the physics of the emission of those things. So although we don't really know what causes FRBs, in fact, uh, we're very far from knowing definitively what causes FRBs, uh, we're getting some very important clues. Jean-Pierre, earlier in the show, we were talking about climate change. As someone who studies the wider universe, what are your thoughts on how humans treat our planet? Well, I think the physics on climate change is pretty unequivocal. And if you want evidence for that uh, throughout the universe, one only has to look as far as our uh, neighbour in the solar system, Venus, which is by no means closest to the sun, that's Mercury, but uh, the mean surface temperature of Venus is so much higher uh, than all the other planets in the solar system. And that's an example of a runaway greenhouse effect. And you wouldn't want to be on the surface of Venus. Jean-Pierre Macca, thanks so much for being with us on Global Science. A pleasure, Nula. Remember to hit subscribe for our regular videos. And while you're here, check out our past episodes.